All right, folks, welcome back to the channel and to another Hickory Hacker course vlog. This week, I'm at Yale Golf Course, New Haven, Connecticut. This is a historic and architecturally significant golf course that also happens to be pretty difficult. Uh, but we had a blast playing here, and I'm excited to tell you more about it. This course was designed by Seth Rayner with Charles Blair McDonald, and there are a lot of fascinating architectural features to talk about over the course of this round. Here's what's in the bag for this round, sponsored by Stewart and Jacoby. Using my primary hickory set with one exception I'll tell you about in a bit, and a Callaway Super Soft Ball. And here's a scorecard for the front nine at Yale. We're playing the regular course. Everything starts with number one, called Eli, par four, 340 yards. Here's my playing partner today, Jacob Orcutt, co-founder of the Connecticut Hickory Golf Association. And here's me in my first round using every aspect of the single playing golf swing. If you watched my uh, recent video where um, I practiced with Parker Elrod down in Georgia, this round was about three or four days after that practice session. So still had some of the tips fresh in my mind, but uh, plenty of others that I had already kind of lost track of. Made uh, some mistakes in this round that I attribute to just not being comfortable with, this, with the full single plane swing quite yet. Uh, but other aspects of my game were still holding up pretty well, including the putting. Nice tap in for Jacob. Jacob had a real nice round here. I don't remember what exactly he scored, but uh, you'll see plenty of nice shots from Jacob. And you'll need him too, because I, I had some rough patches in this one. Fortunately, that was a good start for a double bogey. All right, number two is called the Pits, par four, 344 yards. And here's the exception to my all authentic bag today. This is my old Louisville Golf Walter Hagen splice neck replica. And uh, in my practice session with Parker Elrod using the full single plane swing, I hit some really nice drives with the Hagen. And I figured um, at Yale, I needed all the help I could get well hitting some good shots off the tee because even though it's not that long, we we're playing this at 5,900 yards, there are a lot of forced carries off the tee, as you're going to see soon. And um, I, I just felt like I was going to be more comfortable using the replica than the authentics. I'm not sure why I did that because uh, I did, didn't did really hit any better shots with the replica uh, over the authentics, as you'll see and probably should have just stuck with one club. But it was basically musical chairs this entire round between the th my two authentic brassies and the Hagen replica. And uh, yeah, like I said, should have stuck with just one. As you see, Yale's a beautiful course, and this was a beautiful time of year to be here with the trees changing color. I'll tell you more about the trees and how that figures into the future of this course as we go. But first, number three, called Blind, par, par four, 379 yards. There's a beautiful drive. Jacob. So here's one of the force carries I mentioned. And uh, Yale is one of those courses for me that just gets in your head right away. Yeah, I knew I needed to get over this. I figured I'd try one of my authentics and I end up drop kicking my tee shot just down this hill. Barely had any grass to work with here. Also, uh, this was my fourth shot right here because my first tee shot went into the water. So yeah, like I said, Yale can get in your head. The penal aspects of the design here can be navigated successfully and you can score well, but if you don't navigate them, this course will punish you. Here's the namesake of the hole, the blind approach. That's right on the green. Nice shot. Thank you. Great shot. Jacob navigated that perfectly. Meanwhile, I got to drop this in for a double bogey. I don't think that's going to happen. Spoiler alert. Not a bad shot though. I figured my course handicap for this round and the worst I could do on any hole was an eight. So I'm definitely headed in that direction. Here's Jacob's birdie attempt. Get in there, get in there. And it just burned oh. the edge. But Jacob played a great hole there. He tapped that in for par. And I'm getting out of here with a nine, but an eight on the scorecard. And that brings us to number four, the road hole. Par four, 410 yards. This hole is the first of the notable templates here at Yale and is based on the 17th at St. Andrews. C.B. McDonald spent a lot of time in Scotland in the 1880s at St. Andrews and also playing other courses in Scotland. And his template approach to design is basically a collection of his favorite golf holes in Scotland. 
They were holes that he considered to be the ideal golf holes and uh, was able to basically apply those uh, concepts to his golf course designs here in America. And Seth Rayner, who's the actual uh, credited designer of this, this course, even though McDonald has traditionally been credited as the architect, uh, Rayner did the, the heavy lifting here and was McDonald's protege. So Rayner uh, famously applied McDonald's template design to uh, his own designs. And uh, Yale still holds up as one of the best examples of several of the templates that you're going to see here today. Meanwhile, I played the second half of this hole pretty well after that approach with the mashie. Nice two putt there. Moving on to five, this is called short, par three, 135 yards, pretty self-explanatory. This is based on the fourth hole at Royal West Norfolk. And uh, the, the key here, the test is accuracy off the tee, obviously, and Jacob got himself on the green there. And then accurate putting. So pretty much any par three, kind of similar, but uh, these are often elevated greens uh, with bunkering like this all the way around it. Uh, I found the left side uh, of the bunker. I wasn't in the bunker, but I was in some rough. Uh, so just to give you a good tour of what the bunkers look like there. Glad I didn't have to play out of it. First time I played here at Yale, I had to play out of uh, the, the bunker in the front, and uh, it wasn't fun. All right, so number six, Burnside, par four, 349 yards. Back to the Hagen. And that was my best drive of the day with the Hagen. My, my game plan here, though, was not to just stick with the Hagen then after that. I figured, okay, I hit a good one with the Hagen. Now let's try to do that with the Authentics. So I wasn't trying to just rely on the replica club. I knew that I wanted to get better with the Authentics. Uh, it was just basically to recalibrate my, myself using the full single plane swing. Still not sure that really helped me. Putter's holding up pretty well for me today so far. Uh, the greens were running uh, probably slower than they normally do. I think this was maybe a week and a half after they had been punched for the fall. So, yeah, not running as fast as they normally would, but uh, plenty of undulation there. Number seven is called Lane, par four, 350 yards. Key feature on this one is the gradual um, slope up from your approach to the green. I suppose this uh, mound here on the right is a feature. I found this both times that I've played here. And that's the play basically to just pop it back over there to get back into the fairway. Here you see kind of this ramp up into the green. I think it was about 45 yards, but definitely played longer than that. Fortunately, I, I kind of thinned that mashie and uh, was able to skip it up onto the green. And then here you see the green slopes severely from back to front. So that's a touchy putt from back there. But I navigated that pretty well for a bogey. Moving on to number eight, Cape, par four, 382 yards. This hole is based on the first at Macrahanish. And if you watch the Sweetens Cove course vlog, you'll remember that number six there is also a Cape. The defining feature of a Cape is a hazard down the length of the left side of the hole, uh, but it gives you a strategic option to try to bite off a lot on the left side off the tee or play it safe on the right. I didn't mean to play this far left uh, and actually lost that ball and had to waste a couple shots getting back into the fairway. So I'm hitting my fourth here. Thought this was a pretty good shot with my mashie, but uh, put it too far left and I found this deep bunker on the left side of the green. I didn't think I was in here either, so I walked all the way over here for my bag with the wrong club. And uh, I won't blame that for this debacle, <laughs> trying to get out of this bunker, but I uh, didn't do myself any favors bringing a smooth face mashie down there with me. So yeah, another instance of a uh, bad tee shot pretty much putting me behind the eight ball right off the bat on, on a hole and uh, adding the strokes up fast. Wow. Takes us to number nine, the famous Biarritz template, par three, 185 yards, massive green with a uh, trough kind of separating it into two sections. Jacob found himself on the right side, pin high, but off by that bunker. The Biarritz is the uh, based on the third hole at, uh, I believe it's the La Faire course at the Biarritz Golf Club in France. 
And I haven't played it yet where the pin has been on the back part of the green so you can kind of roll it through that trough. Actually, after we played the hole here, we, we actually went up to the top part of the green and just kind of tried to putt down through that trough, which is a lot of fun. But obviously this hole can play very different if the pin is way back on the, on the back of the green and you're you know playing from the tips. Uh, you can make this hole very difficult. That was a good putt to close out the front nine, but a lot of eights there, too many eights. Gave me a 57 for the front. So here's the back nine. You'll notice we didn't have any par fives on the front. We have two on the back. Everything starts with carries, number 10. Par four, 356 yards. Using the Kennel Splice Neck, a little more consistent now in this round. Realize that I should probably just stick with one club. Found myself on the left side, but that wasn't a terrible tee shot considering what I've been doing so far, and I found the ball. This is where things fell apart, though. This rough wasn't that bad, so I'm not real sure what was going on here, but I um, was using the McGregor flanged mashy niblick, and I just could not get under the ball. Finally, I got under it and ended up hitting onto the step, and it bounced it right into the bunker. So obviously the tough part of this hole, this is the second hardest hole on the course. This approach is brutal. Um, it's hard to get up on this green, and then when you do, it's got the severely sloped uh, kind of lower bowl area, and uh, just based on where the pin is, this can be a treacherous green. Here you see that slope go behind me a little bit. If you're up the top of that, putting down to this hole, that is brutal. All right, number 11, Valley, par four, 334 yards. Very scenic vista from here and a scenic drive from Jacob. Got himself in the center of the fairway. All things considered, that was a decent drive because I actually got it off the tee and out there. Here I'm using the Tom Stewart J iron just to punch it back into play. <laughs> Jacob was set up real nice for this approach. And oh, nice play. textbook hickory golf play there, rolling it up onto the green. My shot with the J-Iron just came short of the green, but uh, I was using the mashy here and got under that too much. I had a lot more green to cover and uh, did not hit that very well. That left me with this lengthy putt, albeit for par. Not a great attempt there. Yep. Just didn't putt very well on this hole. All right, number 12, Alps, par four, 343 yards. This hole is based on the 17th at Prestwick. Got a, some ground to cover here off the tee. I hit that way left. Had to punch that back into the fairway. Uh, the Alps strategy here is ideally get yourself in the center of the fairway off the tee for the blind approach up to the green. Can't see anything uh, on your approach. So truly blind, can't even see that there's a bunker in front of the green there that I found, uh, but I was able to get out of that. And then when you do get up to the green here, again, you've got kind of a two-tiered setup. I found myself on the lower part of the green putting up, but that was actually a pretty good putt. Nice putt there from Jacob. And I got a short one here to clean up for double bogey, which I make. All right, on to number 13, my favorite hole on the course, par 392 yards, Redan. This is based on the 15th at North Berwick and is basically a 45 degree a green that slopes from right to left and front to back and is protected by the Redan bunker, which Jacob found on the left front. If you hit it on the right side, which I'm headed that way, but a little too far right, if you get it on the right side of the green, you get a, you, you often get a nice kick toward the hole. Uh, that happened to me my first time playing here, but uh, I, like I said, I was too far right of that to get a kick. So I used the mashy to get up pretty close to the hole. Not too bad there. Jacob took several shots to get out of the Redan bunker, uh, but uh -oh. that was a nice save for double bogey. Here's my par putt.
Not terrible. But, suggest I should try a different technique for short putts. All right, number 14, Knoll, par four, 342 yards. For some reason, I went back to the Hagen splice neck, and I wish Jacob would have knocked it out of my hands before I swung it. There was no reason for me to go back to that club, but I ended up losing that ball, and I'm now using the Tom Stewart J iron with my third shot to get back into play. I did that successfully. The Knoll is a template based on the fourth hole at Scott's Creek, and its uh, defining feature is the elevated green that I'm trying to get onto now with the mashie and uh, end up pulling that shot left. But that'll give you a good view of the steep sides of the green. So my game plan here is to just drive this ball into the hill and pop it up using the mashie, and uh, pretty much did exactly what I was trying to. And now all I need to do is hit the putt. Which I do. All right, moving on to 15, Eden, par three, 141 yards. This is based on the 11th hole at St. Andrews. Two deep bunkers protect the green. You've got the hill on the left and the strath on the right, which I'm headed toward, but come up just short, fortunately. Use the Nemashi Niblick. See if I can pop it over the strath bunker. And I do. And that gives me another rare par attempt for this round. Oh, uh -huh. it's one of those where I felt like I probably should have taken the stick out and it would have gone in. All right, number 16, par five, first one on the course. Lang, 465 yards. Using a different brassy now. This is the McGregor Master Brassy. And uh, that's the kind of result I should have gotten from switching around again. So now I've got a lengthy shot for my third because I couldn't. I had to take an unplayable lie on that tee shot. So that shot got me back into the fairway. And I'm sitting about 250 out now using the Kennel Splice Neck once again. Got lucky there. Jump over the hill. And that put me about 145 yards out using the Tom Stewart J iron. And just bounced it out of that bunker, fortunately. Here's the Hagen sand wedge. Probably should have used something with a little less loft on it to get some roll out there. So I left with a lengthy putt here. Nice. That was a pretty nice putt there though. All right, number 17, nose, par four, 395 yards. Defining characteristic of this one is the unique bunkering in front of the green right in the middle of the fairway called the principal's nose, based on a feature uh, that's on the 16th hole at St. Andrews. Also got some water to cover here off the tee. And I'm back to using the Kennel Splice Neck, and uh, that's the club I should have been probably using all round. Good tee shot there. I stuck with it here again for my second and another good shot. Here's a closer look at the uh, obstacle that the principal's nose can provide a hole. Jacob uh, was able to skip his up and over it. It's a uh, considerable feature that really forces you to make some tough decisions when, on your approach. Fortunately, I was left enough that I was able to just kind of pop it up onto the green, but this is another big green with kind of a trough to navigate here between me and the hole. Yeah, this was a tough, tough putting hole here. All right, number 18, home, par five, 542 yards. This is a monster to finish on. You wanna get it over that area that Jacob's heading Perfect. over right now. That's the right line for putting yourself in position for your second shot. I'm back to the Kennel Splice Neck again and uh, ended up hooking this one a little bit and uh, that's gonna make the hole longer for me. This does give you a good look at the two options you have from this point. So you can go left, which is to a hill that has an elevated approach into the green, or you can go right, which is easier to get into, but it's a longer approach to the green. 
I ended up splitting the difference and getting into this grassy area in between. So I used my mashie to get up to the top of the hill here on the left side, and that gave me a nice vantage point into the green. Uh, before we wrap this roundup, though, I want to mention something I alluded to earlier, which is the future of the golf course. Uh, I mentioned there are a lot of trees here, and uh, the trees have basi basically been allowed to grow in areas where they weren't originally uh, in 1925 when the course opened. So in 2021, Gil Hance was selected to be the person to restore Yale to its 1925 glory, and I've got more information on that in the description below. Meanwhile, we're trying to wrap up our round on the present day Yale. That one was close. That'll do it. All right, thanks for watching, folks. That wraps up our round here at Yale. Hope you enjoyed this walk through history. Had a lot of lost shots off the tee on the back nine for 54 and a total of 112. All right, so that was my last course vlog of 2021. I have a couple weeks here between this one and the next one, which will be the first course vlog of 2022, and I'm looking forward to bringing that to you. In the meantime, here's some videos from the archive for you to check out. And if you like what you see here, please like and subscribe to the channel. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.